Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is John Harris, and you are listening to 21st Century, uh, 21st Century Dentistry. Um, I appreciate you joining us today. If you're enjoying the content and find value in what we're doing on this podcast, please uh, click the subscribe button um, below and click the notification bell um, so that you get notified of any new episodes that come out. So with me today, I have Mr. Mark Murphy, um, he's an incredible friend and colleague of mine. He's been working in the dental industry for quite some time. I'll give him a few minutes to kind of catch you up on who he is and, and what he's all about. But I'm really interested in talking uh, through some of the details um, in his latest book, uh, Extraordinary Wealth. He's got another one coming out, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but I think it's short building extraordinary wealth. And actually, the the um, the subtitle says the guide to financial freedom and living an amazing life, um, which I think those two things sound pretty darn attractive. So I thought it'd be worth the conversation and get some key insights from from the man himself. Uh, so, Mark, how are you today, sir? How are you doing, my friend? It's uh, thanks for thanks for having me on. I was, uh, you know, I, I was I was thinking about what we were going to talk about today, and I was thinking about what you and I had in common. And I, I will tell you this, um, the, the single largest vertical that we work with is dentists. You know, we work in the construction industry. We work with hedge funds and private equity. We have a lot of celebrities and athletes. I'm an NFL registered player financial advisor. But our biggest single ver- vertical is the dental industry. And about 35 years ago, John, and I think it's for you, it's got to be at least 20 years, 15, 20 years. I know you're a lot younger than I am. But the idea is that I decided about 35 years ago that I wanted to be a hero to, to entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial dentists, and entrepreneurial thinking dentists. And so what we've done is we've tried to create a business, which you know you are a big part of in my world, is that we wanted to surround ourselves with other people that wanted to be a hero to the same group. And so I think in a lot of ways, what you and I have done, and, and we've done with Fortune, and we've done with Northeast uh, Private Client Group, it's quite a private client group, and I could probably give you six or seven or eight other, let's call it alliance partners or people that wanted to be heroes. Rather than call them alliance partners, I'd rather call them heroes and people that want to be heroes to entrepreneurial dentists. And I think what's been so magical is immediately the doctors recognize the synergy. Immediately the doctors recognize that there is simple spe- something special going on, that there is some experience that they can get nowhere else in the world but by working in this entrepreneurial think tank, this entrepreneurial mindset, to be able to help people dream and think about possibilities in their life that they never even thought of. In fact, I, you know, I know, is, I know you and I have some of the great work that we do together is literally have people crying because they said, I never thought that big, or I never thought that was possible, mm-hmm. or I never thought a guy like me or a gal like me could ever do that. And when you're changing lives of all the people you touch, that doesn't seem like a business. It seems more like a calling. And I know that's another thing you and I have in common. Um, and there was a book that came out that that described our business, came out about two years ago from Dan Sullivan. And it was a book that when I read, I go, this is exactly, they put together the words of what we have been doing for 35 years. And the book is called Who Not How. And, and, and the question I think I've been asked probably 10,000 times, John, is how do I grow my income? How do I grow my business? How do I grow my freedom of time? How do I grow my freedom of relationship? It's all tied up in one of those questions. And we always thought that was the wrong question because if it's how I'm one person, you're one person, that doctor is one person. Even if they've got a couple of partners, they're three people. It's very daunting. And so we always thought the right question should be, who do we need to collaborate with to grow our income? Who do we need to collaborate with to grow our, our business? Who do we need to collaborate with to grow our freedom of time and freedom of relationships? So it's who, not how. And so just with sort of that introduction, I want to thank you for being a who for me and, uh, and, 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 allowed and, be, and been such a great collaboration partner. You know, I, I start by believing that I've always had a coach and I believe that every entrepreneur should have a coach and uh, anybody that's been lucky enough to select you or one of your coaches is, is damn lucky as far as I'm concerned. Well, I appreciate that. I'm not sure I'm worthy of the recognition, <laughs> but um, but I would certainly consider you uh, one of the most valuable people in my camp as well. As you were talking, um, I was reminded by some advice that I had gotten from you and Ben many years ago. 
um, and it's drastically changed the financial posture that I'm in now, not just the way that I think about finances and, and wealth development and my portfolio, um, but also the advice and guidance that I provide my clients and, and just things that I, I want them to consider because there was a point in time when I didn't consider a passive streams of income. You know, I didn't, re- it wasn't that I wasn't aware that it existed. It just never really was in the realm in which I was thinking. And then when I got into, you know, came over to Fortune as a coach and started to scale my income as a coach and became a franchise owner and then a multi-franchise owner. Um, and then I started bringing in coaches into my network and then multiple coaches. And as I went through that experience, I really started to understand and appreciate the benefit of passive streams of income. And so I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're, you're, turning a handpiece Monday through Thursday and I don't know, you, you're a financial advisor on the weekend or something like that. It could vary. It could be as simple as, you know, owning a dental practice that has multiple providers in the practice. That's, that's multiple streams of income. That's passive income. Those, those providers are turning a handpiece and generating revenue in your business, whether you're there or not. Um, and so, I mean, scaling from there. I think that's a great place to start. It's just getting your practice to that next level to where it's not only solely dependent upon you turning a handpiece, which is an incredibly, which is a substantial amount of liability, right? But once you position yourself so that you've got another provider or multiple providers in there and that business is able to actually produce without you doing the producing, now you actually have a business. Well, absolutely. First of all, I want to acknowledge you with your humility when I, I gave you a compliment because uh, I'm a big believer in that hubris is the ruination of all who have it. And mm-hmm. so I, I believe if you start believing your own BS about yourself, the world has a way of telling you you're not all that. So, so I, <laughs> I, always, I always try to be confident and be humble at the same time because, you know, every, every time, you know, as I said, every time you start believing your own BS, you know, BS, uh, you know the world, world, world knocks you down on your butt. So, yeah. so I, I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you on, on that. The other thing I, I to take pick up on what you said is when you're trading time for dollars, where you're getting paid for what you do rather than what you know, even if you make pick a number million dollars a year, well, in most States, depending on where you are, by the time you pay your federal tax and your state tax, I know in Tennessee, you don't have any state tax. You're paying somewhere between 40 and 50 plus percent of your income. If you're in California or New York or you know, New Jersey or those sorts of states, you're paying, you know, 50% or better of your income. And then after that, when you, you you pay your mortgage and your property tax and you send a couple of kids to school and you take a vacation, you buy a car and some clothes and stuff, well, then there's a little bit of money maybe to put in a 401k or a little bit of money to save in some other places. And you have to hope that if you have a 25, a 35, a 45-year career grinding it out, living comfortably, that you can hope that you can retire in reasonable style most people either work longer than they want to work or they, or they take a big step down in life and retirement. They go from two cars to one, the big house to the small house, you know, drinking imported beer, they go to drink a domestic beer. I, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing, but they're downsizing. And so the, the argument that I would make is that that's why our third book I have coming out in January called The Ultimate Investment. Uh, and it's basically a roadmap to not only growing your business, but it's a roadmap to growing multi-generational wealth. And I think you hit it on the on the, on the spot. You can't a paycheck, no matter how big that paycheck is, it's hard to create wealth saving money. You know, just putting money away every month. You know, I want to save a thousand a month, or two thousand a month, or three thousand a month. At best, you hope for a reasonable retirement. When you're creating multi generational wealth, that's a whole new strategy. It's not only about passive income; it's about earned income for the rest of your life. You know, as a wealth manager, John. There are dozens and dozens of asset classes. But for our purposes, I think there's only two asset classes. And we call them either paychecks or either free capital or playchecks. And so what paychecks are is we want our clients to set up a series of assets that will give them either a guaranteed or a highly reliable stream of income to replace their income as doctors. And we call those paychecks. Then I want another stream of income where we can spend it, we can save it, we can give it away, we can do whatever we want with that money but it will not be responsible for producing income for their family. So if you have both paychecks and playchecks, that's financial freedom. But mm-hmm. there's still one more level. 
And that's why we believe owning a business is the ultimate investment. That if you can have earned income beyond normal retirement age or earned income while you're no longer turning a handpiece full-time or not at all, you can actually be a net saver in your 50s and 60s and 70s, maybe even your 80s. Well, most of your friends are going to the early early bird special or worried about living too long or running out of money. Mm -hmm. And that's how you create multi-generational wealth. It's about getting paid for what you know, not what you do. And, and so, you know, it, and it is, you're right, it is a paradigm shift because most people are not raised that way. So few people will ever do it. And, and if they, but, but the technology is there, unlike our NFL players that have non guaranteed contracts that go an average of three and a half years in dentistry, you got 20, 30, 40 plus year careers. It is almost a crime that every dentist in America does not create multi generational wealth. The tools, the technology, the know how at Fortune, the know how at, at Sequoia Private Client Group is there. You can help folks do that. It's just a matter of whether they want to do it or not. You know, and, and, I, and sometimes, you know, you, you, every, there's you know, what the, the saddest part to me, John, as you know, money is never math. It's always psychological. It's, it's, it's people's own mindset that preventing them from having the success they want. And, and you know, and that's, that's what you and I do so, uh, you know, so well together. Yeah. One of the things I tell folks a lot of the time is that money is a natural consequence of value. I don't know where I got that. It certainly didn't come from me. I'm not that smart, but <laughs> I tend to, I try to, I try to pick up pearls from people who are a lot smarter than I am. And that was a quote that I came across years ago. Money is a natural consequence of value. And so if you just focus on how do I add more value? to my existing relationships with my existing clients? How do I add more value and attract new clients? How can I add more value in a completely different vertical? It, it revolutionizes the way that you perceive um, money creation and generating income. Like it's, it's you should, we, we believe at Fortune that people do the best they can with the resources they have available to them and that there are no unresourceful people, only unresourceful states. So I think when it comes to wealth development, financing, so many people have limiting beliefs and disempowering beliefs around money and around generating income that their brain doesn't even attempt to extract from the environment all of the opportunities that are around them all the time because they're just not in a resourceful enough state. And so one of the things you said, you, you, you called yourself a wealth manager and nothing against being a wealth manager, but I, I think that you're a, a heck of a lot more than that because like your first book was the, the win-win scenario. The win-win guide was a, it was a, it was a guide to buying and selling dental practices, you know, years before we, mm -hmm. you know, long before DSOs came in, you know, we, along with fortune were, we're doing mergers and acquisitions. I, I can, I think my first one was probably 25 years ago when nobody was doing those. Mm -hmm. And you know, before, you know, before, you know, before wall street and, and private equity got into dentistry, that's how we were showing dentists how to create multi-generational wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, you take, you take a million dollar practice with a typical 70% overhead where that doc would be taking home $300,000. Again, very nice salary, very nice income, very nice job. But if we could take that practice next door or down the street that was doing a million, so now we were driving $2 million through the same fixed overhead, you'd see almost immediately with little or no risk, that doc's income would go from $300,000 a year to $800,000 a year. And that was a game changer. Mm -hmm. And they did it without them increasing their time or increasing the amount of patients they saw. But they, were, they went from the practice of dentistry to the business of dentistry, and it became life-changing. And and all of a sudden, we went from doctors who went to dental school because of their great fine motor skills and because they wanted to be these great artists. And then we said, hey, you can still be the great artist if you choose to or not. But, you know, we're really in the business of creating CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would take it one step further, you know, and I, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. But the more I think about the entrepreneurial mindset, I think when you talk to, to, to entrepreneurs, they're not, tie, they're not tied up in titles like I'm a CEO or a COO or a, you know, see whatever you want to say, or they're not tied up about education or they're not tied up about all these things that, that non-entrepreneurial people are, are like. I always say entrepreneurs hire CEOs, they don't become CEOs. So the idea is that, that what they're focusing is, it, is in creation and fascination mode. 
they're just, they're, you know, entrepreneurial people are thinking about what's next. They're thinking about how can I take my creativity and turn that into productivity and then turn that into profitability. I yeah. think that's what, what entrepreneurs do. And, and again, that, so, so, you, you, so you go from taking these pe- people with fine motor skills who are there almost as very elevated tradesmen, and then you're turning them, we're turning them John into CEOs, and then we're turning them into entrepreneurs who think about the, the possibility. I mean, what I wake up every day, John, thinking in our business, in the financial services world, in the family office I run, in the financial services firm that I run, Northeast Private Client Group and Sequoia Private Client Group, I wake up with this mental picture every day of there are four financial services firms and family offices lined up one after the other, and we're one of the four. Why is that client in our world or in the dental world, why is that patient going to pick our office rather than the other three? And just as importantly, particularly in this time and particularly in dentistry, how are the employees and the very best employees, why are they going to pick to work in our office Mm -hmm. rather than the other three? Because, I mean, John, do you know a dentist who's who's not a short a hygienist or a front desk person or a doctor or, or somebody in their organization right now? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cluster stuck there. You know, they, they everybody's short of people. They're all, everybody's shorthanded. And so the idea is if you create the right culture there. And so I just keep focusing on culture, culture, culture. And you go, well, why is a financial, why is a, you know, why is a financial guy focusing on culture? Because it's very clear to me in terms of helping people create wealth is if they create the right culture. Everything else will take care of itself, and then those employees will take care of their patients. In my world, they'll take care of our, our customers, our clients, if we take care of them. And that's why I think that the that's why one of the reasons why you and Fortune Management is such a, a secret weapon for me, because I could go into an organization where the culture wasn't quite right, and I could go bring in the experts, and you guys could go get that culture fixed, and then all of a sudden everybody got a lot of lot smarter, a lot more money was being made. And then the financial guy would be able to then use that money to, to create more wealth or to pay down debt or to do other things that, you know, send that kid to the, the you know, the, the, the private school instead of the, the public school or, you know, whatever the family's priorities were. But all of a sudden we went from a scarcity model where people were just earning money to pay bills. We're now creating an environment where, what do you want out of this life? What's possible? What can I have for myself? What can I have for my family? What can I have for my kids? What, can I, what kind of legacy can I leave? What can I do to make the world a better place? I want to leave this place better than I found it. And th- there's a real abundant discussions. And they're discussions about that are empowering and exciting, as opposed to a, a lot of people who are just kind of grinding into the weekend or grinding into retirement or not really empowered or feeling in charge of their life. We want people to be empowered in charge, but think about possibility. Isn't that, I mean, w- would you describe that's what you do? I mean, you know, tell me, you know, I, the way I describe you, John, I'd say, Executive coach, um, practice management, communications, culture. I mean, best in the world at doing that. When you talk to a potential doctor, what do you tell them that you do? What is what is your role? How do you describe what you do? Hmm. That's usually my exact response because it's it's hard to sum up, in, at least in my opinion. Um, I know where my value is. I know where my value is not. And it's it's difficult to sum up in a way that doesn't sound um, overreaching, I guess. Um, But I I, I feel and I know that I'm certainly in a position to make a transformational impact if I can just get people to see through the fog. So for example, I can't count the number. I mean, with, with, with where the, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday. You know, DSOs in private equity aren't the bad guys, right? Like they saw an opportunity in the industry. That's what they do for a living. That's why they make money is they see an opportunity in the industry. They take a risk. They invest their capital or their client's capital, their investor's capital. And if they're right, they win a lot. And if they're wrong, they lose a lot, you know, but they take risks just like any entrepreneur. But what happened in dentistry and why DSOs had have been on such a heyday is because they exploited an opportunity. You know, there were when it was just private dentists and we were working, they were working three days a week and they were all cash pay and fee for service. The consumer drove that change. The consumer says, wait a second, I want convenience, affordability, 
and quality. I want all three of those things. And if you're not going to offer it to me, I'm going to find somebody that does. And so DSO says, hey, there's an op- there's an opportunity here. How can we better meet the needs of the consumers? And so they came to the market and they did that. Well, what's happened is, is obviously the private practices were much more clinically sound. Um, and they appreciate and value clinical autonomy because that's where the provider's identity comes from is their clinical autonomy. And DSOs need everything to be structure and numbers and measurable. And so the whole subjective space, when do you call it a crown? When do you call it a filling? They, they, their objective was to eliminate that, and make everything very black and white. And so they've learned a lot over the years. They've, they've realized that, hey, dentists don't like that. And so now you've got from DSOs, you've got DPOs. And now the dentists that are being acquired have ownership in the DSO and they have a say and they've got a lot more clinical autonomy and the private practices are becoming more business savvy. And they're starting to, you know, take some of the plays out of the DSO playbook and, you know, bringing in multiple providers and multiple specialists, uh, multiple specialties. And the, the DSOs are getting better at catering to the clinicians and the private practices are getting better at catering to the needs of patients from a, from a business perspective. Um, so there are still some roadblocks that we run into. Like, for example, if I'm a fee for service practice and I've actually got two of these just recently, just this week that I've been working on with clients of mine. Um, but you'll have a practice that wants to acquire the practice next door and do a, you know, roll it in, do an M and a, um, but they get hung up on small details, right? Like I'm not in a network with those two insurance plans and that practice is I'm going to lose those patients. So that means the value to me is way lower. Well, yes and no. Like the, the practice is only worth what you're willing to pay for it, but you're not buying $300,000 worth of revenue because you're three and a half times more productive than the dentist that you're buying. So even, and I've done the math on this all day long, even if you bought the practice at fair market value um, and you lost 25, 35, 40% of the patients, you're still looking at like a three or four to one return. So why are you worrying about losing a hundred patients when you're going to invest 200,000 and make 800? Like think about it in terms of buying a revenue stream more so than buying a tangible patient because the rest of it is just very gray. Like you can't, like you can't like isolate it. The patient may transition. They may not, they may accept dentistry. They may not. So we'll take historical evidence, say your annual patient value. And on average, your patients are spending $1,100 a year with you. And the yeah. that you're acquiring, yeah. they're spending 300. So, I mean, that's, I just, it's it, helping people see through that fog and appreciate the value that's there rather than getting hung up on the fear of making a mistake. If more people were willing to just take that leap of faith, man alive at the transformation that would take place. You, you know, you know, what's great. I think about the DSOs because I think a lot of private practitioners or small DSOs are fearful of them or dislike them. I think what's great about DSOs uh, to me is they have made it very clear that um, dentistry is a business. Uh, it's a profession, but it's 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 also a business. Mm-hmm. And and I think the 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 idea is that if you're going to survive in that game, you got to make it a business. And so I what used to drive me crazy was um, you talk to two businesses that and all they talk about is the top line. Like people would say, you know, you know what is your business worth or what has it done? And they say, well, we collected $5 million last year. And that's like me saying the, the, the ball game last night, did the Yankees win? And they said, well, the Yankees scored four runs. And I go, well, did they win or lose? They go, well, the Yankees scored four runs. Well, if they, the other team scored three or less, the Yankees won. If they scored more than four, the Yankees lost. Mm-hmm. And I think in business, you talk about it's important to know that we did 5 million top line. But I, w- I would literally have these these valuation experts 10 years ago come into a client of mine that was doing five million dollars and they would say it's worth uh they do this complicated analysis it would come out that they it was worth 70 percent of collections Mm -hmm. uh you know within about like a hair's breadth and so they say well you did five million dollars and it's worth three and a half million dollars and they go to the guy next door who did five million say 
his business worth three and a half million too. And then I said to him, well, I looked through the financials and practice A took home 2 million of the 5 million in terms of they took it home to their family. And the other guy, practice B did 5 million and took home $150,000 last year. Mm -hmm. And you say they're both worth three and a half million dollars. Yeah. And so profitability then became important because one is if you decide to keep that practice, which many doctors should forever, even keep it within generations. Um, like every other entrepreneurial business in America, if a business is super profitable, you, you, there may be a reason to go keep it. But the other thing is it allows you to focus on what your real value of your business is. And what's great about the DSOs is, they, is, is we now in dentistry have the vernacular where we're talking about the value of a business based on profitability, not on what the top line is. You know, yeah. Because you know, it doesn't matter how much business, and you can make business decisions because it seemed like every decision was about just bringing in more revenue without taking into account what the acquisition cost, what the cost was to do with that. You know, you know, we just, just keep bringing in. And, th and that's how a lot of these would all call. I am, I am, I'm not pro-insurance or PPO. I'm not negative PPO. I think people that do fee-for-service are doing a great job. I think people that are or doing PPOs are doing a great job. And I think there's a hybrid for a lot of people that works beautifully. But what I'm not for is I'm not for bringing on PPOs or insurance plans where we earn less than what our costs are to operate or, mm -hmm. and we don't get a fair return on our money. And I think we were so, so like obsessed that we we're going to miss out that dentists devalued their, their, their companies and their businesses by taking, by allowing insurance companies to, to, to make us, and sometimes not, not forget work for free. We actually paid them for the opportunity to work. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, we're focusing on profitability more because it's not about doing the most dentistry. It's about, it's about two things about, it's about, being the most profitable, and it's about having a standard of care that is appropriate and, and something you feel proud of in terms of the work that you're doing on your patients, that you and your staff are doing on your patients. Yeah, and that's a big part of the premise behind the DSO model in multiple locations, because if I'm a single location fee-for-service office, and there, there's some real obstacles to tackle there, like, for example, you know, if, if what I can pay a hygienist if I'm if I'm Medicaid is not the same as what I can pay to practice across the street that's fee for service. Like they're going to get all the hygienists. I can't compete with what they're paying. Right. However, and this is where the the the, the economies of scale benefit the multi-location owners. If I'm only going to drop 10 points to the bottom line after all expenses, associates, everybody's paid. And that 10% of a million dollars is a hundred thousand dollars and a hundred thousand dollars isn't enough then go get 10 more just like it and take 10% of 10 million and see if that feels better. Right. And so as you scale your enterprise, now you, now you can compete with the hygienist, the, the practice across the street that's paying their hygienist more because you're playing a different game now. I just, I see a lot of tripping over dollars to save pennies, right? you know? And I'm just like, if you can, like, for example, here's something that occurs in every other industry in the world when we're talking about mergers and acquisitions, but I have yet to see this um, really um, mainstream in terms of acquisitions or even mergers and acquisitions where it's even more common, and that's paying premiums on the acquisition. You know, there are a lot of scenarios where it makes a lot of sense to pay a premium to entice that owner to sell their practice. If they've got real estate with 15 operators, they're only using five and you're blowing the seams and doors off of all of your operators, you can't grow. That opportunity cost is substantial. Does it make sense to pay a premium to the guy down the road where you can mold, you can merge your practice into that practice? And now you've got a bigger practice plus capacity to grow. You know, it makes a ton of sense. If you do the math, it makes a ton of sense. You know, so I don't know. It's just, so I guess that's where I hope to add value um, over time. It's just helping Dennis become more entrepreneurial um, and seeing the real opportunity in the profession that they've chosen. Um, you know, cause I think the the same challenge applies to them that applies to me and you, for example, you're continuing, continually looking for opportunities to add value. You know, you're doing mergers and acquisitions with your clients. You're, you know, building relationships. Obviously, you you've got assets under management. And you're helping giving them. You're you're helping with um, sound financial advice. 
Um, now you're writing books and taking all of the wealth of knowledge that you've acquired over the years and then putting it into a, an easily digestible format so that they can not reinvent the wheel, right? And kind of speed up the learning curve of the people that succeed you. So that's just continually adding value. And so it's one of the things that I, I really try to do is just look for areas to, to add value. Sometimes it's, it's from a personal development standpoint. Sometimes it's from a leadership standpoint. Sometimes it's just from business mechanics, you know, and just understanding the industry that you're in and, and what game you're playing right now, because I got, I got news for everybody. The, the, the landscape is shifting beneath our feet as we speak. You know, when you look at, for the last two, three years, and, and you're in this space, I wanted to run this by you to get some feedback, but for the last two or three years, DSOs have been on a heyday. Private equity has been, been um, aggressively funding DSO growth. Um, they've been acquiring everything. Um, the number of deals that they're doing and the size of the deals have been bigger. They're overpaying for a lot of these practices. In other words, they're paying premiums on these practices because they're looking at the big picture and not just how much they're paying for this one practice. Um, and that's changing very quickly. Um, in the last two quarters, the size of the deals that are being funded, the number of deals is, I mean, is, is at lows that haven't been seen in the last 10, 15 years. You know, Q1 and Q2 is very slow um, for, for a lot of private equity. And so when that happens, less practices are getting bought and they're not being not as much as being paid for them. And so what's going to happen is we're going to see a shift from a seller's market to a buyer's market. And so I think there's going to be a lot of deals to be made, you know, in the foreseeable future. Um, and I can only hallucinate the reason that that private equity is pulling back a little bit is because of a quote unquote impending recession, rising interest rates and inflation. And they're just trying to, you know, create liquidity, which, by the way, is one of the principles in your book. Uh, All right. to jump into. But it's from an overall assessment of where the industry is and, and the trajectory that it's on, it, it, am I close there? Well, I just, first of all, I want to thank you because, uh, you know, other than my mother, I, I'm glad that it sounds like you read my books, or at least there's two of you that read read one of my books. So I appreciate, <laughs> uh, I appreciate, you know, my mother would be happy to know you uh, if she, uh, if, if she was alive, she would, she would be happy to know that at least somebody else other than her read that book. But, but I, I think what you're saying, what, well, here's what I hear back, and if I think we're on the same track, is if you have a standalone practice that's, say, doing $500,000 a year, but because of the overhead to run it, the staff costs, the um, the pay, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the rent, uh, you know, the supplies, everything that's there, the practice may not have enough economies of scale where maybe that doctor is taking home $60,000 a year of the $500,000 because it's $440,000 of overhead on a practice like that. And so the practice isn't worth very much. A practice that makes $60,000 a year with somebody working four days a week to make $60,000 a year, they might be better off driving an Uber or working for Uber than, than, than being a dentist at that level. But if you can take that $500,000 and merge it into an existing facility that's already doing a million or two million or three million, they could probably take half of that because all the fixed overhead is covered. Yeah. So that half a million dollar practice merge into a $2 million practice, they might put 250 of that 500 to the bottom line. So when you say overpay, it's worth in that hypothetical yeah. example, four, four and a half times more to that existing business than it is as a standalone practice. Yeah. And, and, and I would say one more thing that, that is a pet peeve of mine is, you know, a lot of people refer to their, their, their staff as overhead or, or sort of people as overhead. I think it's very clear to me. People are either an investment or they're an expense. Yeah. If you're an expense, I want to, if you're an expense, you're always on the chopping block. If you're an investment, I want to get a four or five to one return on my money or more. And so I'm willing to hire anyone or pay anyone what they're worth as long as I can get a return on my investment. But people look at, at staff as overhead. And, and I just don't think that's so. I think it's, you know, you're not growing a business, John, you're growing people. So you've got to invest in those people to, to get a return. Yeah. You know, if not, you know, the only business that don't do it are automated people that use robots and machines, and that's not dentistry at this point. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something that's a you know sort of a huge, huge, huge pet peeve for me because, you know, people are people, and we want to invest in people. We want to, you know, one of the things I'm very prideful of is not only that we've helped clients create multi generational wealth, 
but I believe our business is in place not only to help me create the wealth that I've created, but I think if you, I want to make sure that everybody in my office has the opportunity to do that as well. And I think that one of the things I love about what Fortune does with their bonus program and with their philosophy in general, it's not about just the doctor owner making their dreams come true. It's about making sure that everybody on the team has the opportunity to have a better, a bigger, better future and a better life than they would have had had they picked one of those three other offices instead of coming to the to our office to be to to, to work. And 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 I I I feel great pride in us doing that that in our business and for our clients. And I know you do the same. Yeah. So I I I think. I think the word that I would use to sum up your question, um, what do I do? Uh, I think the word I'm going to go with is inspire. Okay. Because, and the reason is, is it doesn't really matter how much you know, how much experience you have, what system or process you've got. If you don't have a compelling enough reason why to pursue that goal, the system's irrelevant. But if, if you don't have a system at all, but you're inspired and you're like, okay, I, I can, I see clearly I need to position myself as a CEO and not a dentist and, and I need to take the next step and I need to, you know, embrace the fear and all that kind of stuff. Then you're going to force gump your way through it. You're going to figure it out. Fortunately, we've got a lot of, you know, systems and processes and guidance so that you don't have to force gump your way. But, um, but yeah. And I wanted to highlight, uh, and I appreciate that question. That made me think there for a second. I was like, well, man, um, trying to summarize, and I, I marked this, or I highlighted it. Because um, the one question I wanted to ask you is a lot of people will talk to someone in your position, and they're like, yeah, I need this guy works with people who make a lot of money, and you know, they have all this cash flow. Sure, I, I could save more money if I made more money. And I think both of you and I would probably respond to this, that, that comment with, no, you won't. <laughs> because if you're not saving money with how much you're making now, you're not going to save money if you make more. It's not, a, it's not a, an earning problem. It's a discipline problem. So um, the, the, the quote here says, starting with these four parameters, extraordinary wealth is in reach. Uh, and I want to talk about those four parameters. But you take small steps one by one. To build the future that you want. And so I think if, if for somebody that's hearing this, that maybe feels like they're a little bit too far away or their earning potential is too far down. Cause we, you know, we work with dental assistants, we work with lab technicians all the way up to multi-location owners and the earning potential is just very different at the top compared to the bottom. So somebody at the bottom would say, yeah, that's just, it, it's, I'm going to be working until I'm a hundred. Okay. Um, I agree with your statement wholeheartedly. You know, if, if you believe that, then you're never going to take the first step. And it certainly is impossible. But if you're inspired enough to at least take a step, you know, surround yourself with the right people who change the way that you think and just get yourself to take action. Well, now you translate that into momentum and that translates into progress over time. So what, what advice would you give someone who said to you, you know, Mark, I just, I don't make a lot of money and I've got debt and, you know, I'm just, I'm doing good to, to have enough money at the end of the month or, you know, I, what, what, what I, would, I would, I would make that the, the comment, John, is that, you know, to go back is everything is mindset and everything is about everything is, you know, we always like the kid, everything is BS. It's all belief systems, you know, not the BS we, you know, we, we commonly talk about. It's about, it's, 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 it's belief systems. And so the, the, uh, the question I have is like, one of the things that I feel that early on in my relationship, say with Fortune, that, that we did bad work. And I say we do bad work because we did such good work. Is that what we did not do is we did not change people's beliefs around money. So when we help them double or triple their business, where they doubled or tripled their income and they still had their old values around money. All they did was create bigger problems for them. We mm -hmm. actually unintentionally did really bad things to people because, you know, when they were making a dollar, they had terrible habits around money 
and, and we're, you know, they had their backs up against the wall. And then we go, oh, all we've got to do is help them make $2 or $3 and that all their problems are going to be solved. And the answer is it was the exact opposite. We've had to make two or $3 a year instead of a dollar. And then their problems sometimes didn't double or triple. They sometimes you know, quintupled because their, their beliefs around money were bad. So I think the number one job that we have, or I have as a financial advisor, is to make sure people have the right values and the right, the right thoughts around money. Because if you have the right thoughts around money, like I, like I remember the, the epiphany, because you don't grow up this way. Nobody in business school teach you that way. Your mm-hmm. parents don't usually know how to do that. Like you had said, hey, you know, you gave me almost something out of Robert Kiyosaki's book where, you know, I, I thought I'm a smart, hardworking guy. And your belief system, I'm paraphrasing what you said, is I'm just going to go out and work harder than everybody else and care more about everybody else. And I'm going to go out and make a lot of money. And you did that. And by the way, that, you, you, you know, that, that's the first step. But you realize that that was only part of the story. The other part of the story was, at some point, I'm not a machine. I'm only one guy. Me going to work and being about me creating more money is only part of the story. I've got to do that. But how do I have my money work while I'm sleeping? How do, I, how do I create mailbox money so I go to the mailbox and pick up a check rather than me having to go out and work you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week? Mm-hmm. And, and not that you don't want to do that, not that that's not an important integral part to your success. But once you start to have the right thoughts about money, the right thoughts around good debt versus bad debt, the right thoughts about investing versus expenses, you know, the, the whole system in place that once people sort of get that, well, then creating multi-generational wealth goes from being a good idea or something that happens for other people to something that I can see happening. And not only is it possible, it's probable, not only is it probable, but we're going to go make this thing happen. And, and the world, the game slows down and the world opens up and then the world becomes their oyster, but it comes around that belief system. So I don't care if you're, you're, you know, you're broke. I always say, if you're a billionaire or you're broke, we can help you because we can help you create better, you know, better belief systems around money. Mm-hmm. Um, and because that, that's what starts because I, you know, I learned it, you know, it's another example that I, you know, I would do it, do it as well. We'd have people that were in like credit card hell. They had maxed out their credit cards. And we develop a strategy to pay their credit cards back. And so they paid their credit cards off, but they still have bad beliefs around money. And I came back, you know, a year later or two years later, and instead of having, you know, $60,000 of maxed out credit cards, they had $120,000 of maxed out credit cards. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's that way in every life. It's that way about diets. It's that way about relationships. It's that way about marriage. It's about everything. You know, that, that, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was kid, uh, some of my friends have been married many, many times. It seems like they just get a younger version of their spouse, but the problems stay the same. So, you know, I always say, hey, you, you know, you love that first spouse and you got four kids with them. Let's let's go get the right belief systems around marriage and 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 keep all our money and keep our family together. You know, it's it's uh, you know, you know, maybe that's a you know too uh, you know too close to the best or too you know sensitive a conversation, but I think the point's the same. It's it's in every place, it's the same thing. And, and remember, it doesn't happen by chance or by her, 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 uh, circumstance. It happens by science. All of this is a science. All of this, we have the technology. All of that is we have the system in place so that anybody can do this. You just have to have the, both the wherewithal and the desire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you, I think you hit the nail on the head, too. It's, it's with mindset being behind it because you've got the systems and technologies that have proven to create you know, long-term wealth over time. But if you don't have the discipline, for example, parameter number one, live below your means and save 15% um, and uh, establish protection for yourself. So disability, life insurance. I just was asking uh, Ben yesterday about um, uh, Brittany's disability and, and, and whole life. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the discipline to live below your means, then you're you're not, you don't have the cash available to save 15%. Um, and if you don't have the cash available to save 15%, you probably don't have the cash to put into uh, your protection bucket. So having, I think it, what is it? 70, I think, well, I can't remember what the st- actual statistic was, but it's like 70, it's actually higher than that, I want to say. Um, it's like close to 90% of the population doesn't have $1,000 in savings. Well, it, it's, a, it's a crazy number. I think it was like 70%. Yeah. Um, 
I, I was going to uh, say to you on this is if you're looking to get your money to work for you and you're looking to have passive income, you're looking to have income or create those paychecks we discussed, if you're consuming 100% of what you earn, you never have the discretionary piece to get your money to go work for you. So I always say that it's important where you put the, your money. But the most important single thing you can do is to commit to putting a minimum of 15% of your gross income away. Some, and, and, and I say a minimum. 20% is better than 15. 25% is better, than, better than, than 20. But the argument is, I don't know people's mortgages or how many kids they got to educate or what their expenses are or what their student loans are or any of that kind of stuff. But the idea is, don't go, if you can't do 15, can you do 10? If you can't do 10, can you do seven? If you can't do seven, can you do three? It needs to start someplace where you can start to create some critical mass where you can have your money start to work for you. And I think the other thing is the protection piece is protecting yourself from death or disability or lawsuit or creditors or any of the things that, 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 that could potentially attack us is I think everybody thinks that all of those bad things are going to happen to somebody else. They're not going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the things that occur, people never anticipate people always react to things after the fact and they go oh my god we are we are we are in trouble we're screwed we're this we're that the other thing where you could have proactively anticipated that there was a probability of some of those things happening and so you want to be you want to be of our protection first you want to be saving and then it's it's important where you put the money but the most important thing is the commitment to the discipline to do that you know i think i think discipline happens in people's lives it's a it's a system in place. It's a science in place to be able to have discipline to do things. And, um, you know, and, and by the way, maybe that person like you described, that person who, and let's say we could not find a way for them to, you know, put 15% or even put 1% away. Well, then maybe the strategy, John, instead, and let's, let's assume we accepted that, which I don't accept, but let's assume for, for the discussion, we accepted that. Well, then why don't we sit down and, and, and talk about what you talked about before? Why don't we sit down and say, let's figure out then how you can create more value so you can get paid more. And so then maybe if I can get you a 10% raise because you're creating that much more value, can we take half of that 10% raise and put it away? So we take 50% or 5%. If you get a 10% raise, then could we put away 5% of your income of that 10% increase? Keeps doing what you're doing now, but put away the increases and then put the plan together. It may happen a little slower than if you could put 15% away right off the bat. Yeah. But can you start slowly? And, and with the mindset is contagious. Success is contagious. Success is contagious. Discipline is contagious. I Just like family. Yeah, so I want to highlight something that you said before I forgot, before I forget, because it, I think it just shows the commonality in our, philosoph our philosophies. Um, he did not for, for non dental practice owners or for any dental uh, practice employees that are listening to this. What he did not say was let's figure out how I can earn more. So let's go ask for a raise. What he did say, because I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I right. think, me personally, I think that's selfish. Go in and asking for something, but not offering anything in return. I think that's selfish. Um, but if, if I go and say, how can I create more value? Or, you know, what could I do to become worth more per hour? That's an entirely different conversation. And I would encourage any doctors or practice owners to make sh absolutely certain that you are able to answer that question when your people come to you. You know, because if, if they come to you and they say, they ask you, you know, doc, how can I add more value or how can I become worth more? And you can't answer that question right off the top of your head. Then. Obviously, it's not that important to you that they learn how to add more value, because if it was, that would be a predominant focus for you. So I would, or maybe, and maybe it's you just did what weren't aware that that was something to focus on. But I, I I'd absolutely subscribe to that philosophy. And, and and how do I add more value? Not just how can I convince somebody to pay me more? Yeah, I think I think there's that's that's an employee mentality, and. Uh... You're right. I think I, I I I love that languaging, John. John, about it's it's something that's selfish. You're asking for something without offering something in return. But I also think it's also incumbent upon the dentist or the owner of the practice to be able to help coach that person to to show them where that 
where the opportunity to add more value is. That I think that people won't necessarily, you know, instinctively, most people may not recognize that. Um, but you want to help them so that that you can give them a path to a bigger, better future. Mm. And um, you know, and and those, and and I think the people that take it need to be rewarded uh, when you do that. I think that that's 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 part of the, you know, you know, you know, part of part of the game. But again, if people are adding more value, then you should be creating more wealth as the owner. Remember that increase in pay didn't come from you; it came from growing the business. And so, so uh, what I love about that, that kind of bonus plan or that kind of strategy is that it gives it gives um, um, it gives a clear roadmap. Remember, it's the same thing. People ask us, you know, they ask you, you know, what can we expect from your firm? And I think it's the same thing that a client would ask that that it would be for an employee. I always say to an employee or I say to a client, they can expect three things from us. They can expect some direction, and then we give them a clear path along the journey. They can expect some creativity. Some of it's going to be simple, some of it's going to be sophisticated, but it's going to be mom and apple pie stuff. Everything above the table, nothing below the table. You know, an IRS agent, their their tax attorney, their CPA, uh, the editor of the Wall Street Journal could sit in on this discussion. And uh, I think, and, and everything would work. And then I think that the, the third thing would be they can expect some companionship. And I think that we need to bear there every step along the, the journey with them, not only with the clients, but the people we work with. Yeah, I like it. Another another thing that you mentioned here, and so just looking at the, the four parameters, obviously, we discussed the first one, live within your means, say 15% and establish protection. Um, understanding that liquidity is keen. And making sure that you've got cash reserves set aside, whether that's in you know whole life protection or um, maybe a brokerage account or just liquid savings, um, but but liquidity. Uh, and then um, also, you introduce a concept here. You, you say be your own CFO. And so when I hear that, what what I interpret that to mean is, well, if I'm going to be my own CEO, I need to have some level of understanding of how finances work. How money works, how money's created. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What do what do you what do you mean when you're talking about be your own CFO? Well, I think more, most people spend more time planning a family vacation than they do working on their personal finances. So mm-hmm. I encourage all of our clients to invest to hire themselves as their own CFO. Um, so that they're working and understanding how their money works. I think so many people are just clueless in terms of what happens. Even some very, very smart, very successful, sophisticated people, they don't pay attention to that or have somebody to pay attention to that. And so I think that that's the, that it, becoming your own CFO, being aware and not just letting the world and fate take along the way, but having a plan, being a person with a plan, everything has to happen with intentionality. It doesn't happen by accident. Totally agree. So actually having a actually having a financial plan, and then following that plan, just like any other, executing, identifying how much you're going to put uh, how much you're going to put into savings, um, getting with your advisor and getting your protection established, um, and then looking for ways. So once you've got like those benchmarks established, this is how much is getting saved. This is how much is getting put here. Then look for opportunities to accelerate the top line. Yeah, I think I think what you do, I think what you do, uh, John. What annual planning to me is another word for business plan, mm-hmm. but it's not just a business plan. It's a life plan. It's a financial plan. Could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a. It's it's um, a personal development plan. You know, I think I think so many so many folks don't visualize, don't really write down their goals, really don't focus on on putting a plan together for success. You know, you know, one of the things that I, I, that allows me to stay present is I always try to focus on my future self. And what I mean by that is I, don't, I try not to be, I stay present by not being in the present, if that makes sense. And I, I focus on not where I am today. Where, where do I want to be in six to 12 months? Where do I want to be in three to five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years or more? And then focus on what are the things and skills and actions that I've got to take to become that person or to become, or to have that business or to, to, to accomplish that goal. And then it allows me to then be clear, have clarity and presence of mind to then focus on what I need to do to get there 
as opposed as opposed to just focusing on what the tasks of the day are. Outstanding. So, so which, which I think makes makes it makes an, it, it just makes it just makes a it just make, makes a lot of a lot of sense. And, and and as I say, I think when you come back is you know, we want to we want to. You know, we, you know, I always thought, you know, one of the things when I started this company 35 years ago, I think it's about 37 years ago, I, I thought we'd be successful. I thought we would make money and, and we have, but this was really my vehicle to make other people's lives better. Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately that that's the focus that you have every day is you want to sit back. And I think one of the reasons that I think people pick our firm rather than the other three that are lined up, or they pick your firm rather than the other three is that I think people know that that's the basis of how our company was founded. It's not to, not, not to just to make the most money or it's not just, you know, and we've been, we've been very successful. We've been so grateful for what, what, what's occurred or, or we'd be the biggest or we'd be the, the best or we'd be the, that, that stuff. But when you sit down and people know when you can't, you can't fool people for a long time. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can, you know, you know, after a while, kind of people figure out, do you walk the walk and talk the talk? Everybody comes in and they're going to do all kinds of things for you. And then once the, the ink's dry on the contract, they don't do a darn thing for you. People know it, whether you're, you're playing full out or you're all in or you're not. And, and I think people count. Remember, people, people, know, you know, people, people smell that and see that, you know, in, in a nanosecond. And that's got to be a differentiation factor, you know. What I used to say is, is like one of the things that used to really bug me, and as you know, John, because you know me a long time, a lot of stuff bugs me. But what what uh, what used to bug me is when I hear people say, you know, all I want is a level playing field. And then for years, like decades, I would say, well, that sounds stupid to me. I go, who would want a level playing field when you can like run straight downhill? And then that wasn't good enough after a while. And then I'd sit down and I'd go, well, who wants to run straight downhill? I want to play in a competition-free zone. Where the only place that patient could get that experience is to come into my dental practice or, or my firm or your firm. We want to play in a competition free zone. And then I, as I've been thinking more about it, my thoughts evolved even one more level where I've sought back and I go, when I was earlier on in my business, I used to think about what the competition was doing. You know, I was thinking, you know, I think about my firm and those other three firms lined up one after the other. And I, I, I came to the conclusion that I don't believe in competition, competition. I believe in differentiation. How do we create differentiation for our firm or their practice so that we do play in a competition-free zone? And the only way to do that is to work on our capability. And so I just continue to work on our capability every day. And if we continue to add capability to our firm and we do it in both elegance and excellence, we're going to be the firm of choice. They're going to be the dentist of choice. Mm -hmm. You're going to be the executive coach of choice. And that's, that's how we've done it. I like it. So to kind of to kind of summarize this conversation, and I want to give you a couple of minutes to talk about your new book coming out. What what we can look forward to there. Um, the the premise behind this book is essentially the, the three levels of multi generational wealth. Um, and then so the first level is just w- which I would say that arguably the vast majority of people spend their entire careers and their entire lives just trying to get level one, which is passive streams of income. Um, because when once you've achieved passive streams of income, that gives you now the opportunity to do what you discussed earlier, which was um, play checks and money above and beyond what you need to live that you can do with what you choose. You know, fund a lifestyle, you know, and, and, and invest in your future, invest in your children's future, et cetera. And then ultimately getting to a scenario where you've got more than enough money like level three, like you've got more than enough money than you'll ever need, more than enough money than you need now or will need in the future. Everything's paid for, everything's funded. And you can basically just, I mean, do with your financial resources as you as you so choose. Okay. Um, and then your your book, you know, walks through these concepts and principles and your four parameters. And um, so this is actually my second or third time through this. And I'm probably going to read it again because I go through it pretty quick. It's not, it's a pretty fairly quick read. Um, but um, but yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed the stuff that you've the stuff that you've come out with, and thoroughly enjoyed you know learning from your background and experience. And I'm I'm eager to see you know what's in your what's in your next your next book. 
Is this, I, this is I, your, I would say this would be your third word? I like to use, John, is the word I like to use is, or two words is cash confidence. That, that mm-hmm. ultimately, if we can get people to cash confidence where they're not worried about where that mortgage or rent check is going to be paid, or they're not worried about the next meal is going to come from, the first, where you got to do the first level of lifting is get them to cash confidence. Because they, if they get to cash confidence, then you can create, create multi generational wealth. And remember, the reason why I say that the ultimate investment is owning your own business is that if you have $500,000 of profit from your business, that's like having 10 million in the bank earning 5%. Mm-hmm. And so, so ultimately having earned income in perpetuity or, or beyond normal retirement age or beyond the time you turn is a possibility for people. That's how they create multi-generational wealth. You know, remember if, if you make $500,000 from the profit of your business, not as the doctor, not as the landlord, but as the owner and CEO of the business, if you made $500,000, And your expenses are $400,000. You could be a net saver of $100,000 a year. So when all of your friends are are worried about living too long and going through their cash, you're a net saver. Mm -hmm. Just like, but let's say you make $500,000 a year and your income and uh, and you need to spend $700,000. I'm ignoring taxes for a minute. Well, then your portfolio and your critical mass only has to produce $200,000 of that income, not the $700,000. And so it's an abundant mindset, but it's to get to cash confidence so that you can then start to start to work on what I'll call multi-generational wealth. And, you know, we, we don't represent, we have about 4,000 corporate clients. And um, I think we've got, you know, depending on how you measure it, four or five that are billionaires or multi-billionaires out of 4,000. So it's not like we're dealing with billionaires every day. We don't have anybody that, you know, discovered Apple, you know, or Google or something like that, or we don't have somebody that you had some billionaire app. What we've seen is it's been people that had discipline and a plan and intentionality. And it was the first generation that got to cash confidence and then started to work on the multi-generational wealth concept. And then the second generation stood on their shoulders and took it to the next level with the right values and the right your core values and and determination that the first generation had. You know, they weren't the people, you know, hanging out, you know, spending the money frivolously. They decided to take what, you know, what their parents had given them and stood on stood on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. And then by the third generation, if the family got the culture right and they got the, the, the attitude right, um, that third generation then 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 took them where where you know they're well started with a B rather than with an M. And and so everybody to me is only two generations to becoming a billionaire. Um, and again, does everybody become a billionaire? No, that's not the case. I'm not suggesting it every single person. But the idea is if you can create multi, you don't have to be a billionaire to create multi-generational wealth. And the idea is it's everything should be customized to what you really want to accomplish. You know, one, one of the things that I say probably 10 times a day to people that I have incredible relationships with for 30 plus years, as I always remember, I said, Hey, John, I've, you've heard me say this a million times to you. You don't work for me. I work for you. So the idea is being able to take not my goals, but to take your dreams and your visions of what you want for yourself and then turn that into a reality. And that's what we do. And, you know, I, you know we, welcome, we welcome the opportunity. I thank you. want to thank you for um, all the great work we've done together. And, and thank you for your efforts on, be, on, on my behalf for many, many years. And, and all I want to do is work with you to create, as I said, create just a better life and a bigger future uh, for everybody that we touch. And uh, it was just a pleasure to spend uh, some time with you today. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you in uh, Las Vegas next month. I will certainly be there. So we've got the, we've got the win-win scenario or the win-win outcome. Yeah, it's the win-win guide, the deal maker's guide to, to buying and selling dental practices. You've got yeah. extraordinary wealth, which extraordinary is wealth. the guide to financial freedom. Uh, and then you've got the the ultimate investment, which is you know a roadmap to grow your business and build multi-generational wealth. And the other thing, John, you, you also know is I have a monthly column in dental economics. Mm-hmm. And so I'm writing on dental related topics every month. And you know, uh, you could you could look at that as well. But you know the exciting thing for me is the, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking to clients about 90 days from now, I still have in the laboratory that we're working on in creating strategies to help people. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, that's what, that's what's the exciting part every day is that we're, we're always in creation and fascination mode. And that's what I want, you know, our clients to be into. Very good. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on here today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and, and sharing some of that time with us. You are a wealth of knowledge and experience, which I'm always happy to tap into. And, and it's a, an incredible pleasure to have you in my camp. John, you're the best. Thank you so much. Have a great day.